Okay, so I might be choppers flying overhead, there might be a couple background sounds, but welcome to the Bible. And this is something a series I wanted to get into for a while now, really digging into and getting into the Bible from Genesis to Revelations. We're going to go through every single book, really wanting to get into the overall process of the Bible and what they was trying to do when they came out with the book. When you begin to understand it, they are basically giving you exactly what the scientist has given you and what Kemet has given us as far as the creation story about how our souls came into existence with our bodies as far as the earth coming into existence and everything else. The Bible is a book that is giving you existence from A to Z, but at the same time giving you everything you need to find your true purpose on this planet. It's going to be hard for a lot of people to accept that and believe that, but trust me, as we go on through this series, you'll see what I'm talking about. Step by step, if you watch all my, my videos and follow my series, you'll see as we start digging into different things, we see how the Bible comes into play and how it fits with ancient Kemet. They are trying to reveal something to us, especially in ancient Kemet, which is why when we dig deep into the Bible, it's going back to Kemet because there's a lot it's trying to reveal to us. Now, one of the toughest things is going to be really getting people to see the pattern of the Bible and how when you're going through history, how they took different pieces out of history and put it into the Bible. The whole notion, as I talked about before, of the Bible being as old as they tell us, you got to get that shit out your mind. Once you get that out your mind, understand that the Bible is not as old as they're talking about. As I talked about before, you're not going to get it being older than the 4th century BCE. And that fits with everything as far as with the Greeks giving us the Bible and everything we've seen biblically uh, from their history and from, you know, actual real history. So when you look at that sort of uh, biblical history, as far as the sense of understanding that when it's talking about the whole Hebrew Israelites going out and conquering and everything like that, it's not the Hebrews. And when you can go back and trace those so-called battles and then, uh, you know, put them with actual Greek battles and wars, you can see what they was talking about. As I talked about in uh, Ancient History 1 and 2, we can see what they did. But those patterns, things like that, is how you really start digging into the premise, the true point of the book, which we're going to get into. And, um, you know, really, really having it open up your eyes as to where the Bible is going. The key was in Saturn, Satan 1 and understanding about the garden and how the book starts off, which we're going to get into and really go deeper into all of that and all those different aspects. We're going to also use, of course, the Masonic Bible that I have. We're going to get into that, use that book as well. This is going to help us really differentiate from a lot of different things. Now, the Masons ain't stupid. They didn't make it obvious that their Bible is different from all because that would be too easy for them to just you know uh, show us that you have a Masonic Bible that's different from an actual King James Version it's subtle things and we'll, we'll touch on that but getting into the books from the beginning and really breaking down book by book this is the only way you will truly understand what I talk about and truly understand what's going on and uh, how all this stuff fits and uh, fits in with all reality so when you get through the Bible which I understand it's tough for people to just read it Genesis to Revelation, which is why I'm doing the series. It's tough for people to really focus on it while they're reading. It's a lot of different things people don't understand. It's a lot of things that will confuse you in the book, which is why we're going through this entire series, book by book, Genesis to Revelation. And let's get into it. So now, before we get into this, I want to first uh, thank you guys for taking the time to watch and purchase and support. I really appreciate the support. It's been a lot more supporters, you know, as time has gone on, you know, out of nowhere. Uh, I think because the channel grew so fast, it's been more supporters in America than ever. And the thousands, a lot more people supporting and, um, you know, commenting. And I was just really trying to catch up on the information, which is one of the reasons why I put out the uh, the sale for all of the DVDs. Because it's a lot of people with a lot of questions. And, you know, I don't have time to really go back and answer all the questions and you know that I answered in previous videos. So... Thanks to you guys who have been keeping up with everything from day one. I really appreciate it and I appreciate the support. It's, it's much needed and much appreciated. And um, I think a lot of people, you know, once they get through the series and get through the videos, they have um, so many questions. There's a lot of things. Um, I mean, if you can imagine, if you've been watching me from day one, just look at everything we've been through and imagine yourself as a person not having any knowledge of any of that information, you know, and you have a lot of people. Uh, young and old that's coming into this knowledge with no prior knowledge of nothing, not even knowing the name Kemet or 
understanding uh, that the Egyptians was black. So it's been a lot of people with questions like that. So um, I appreciate the support and um, yeah, let's get into this thing. So we're really gonna be getting into uh, the Bible. As I said, we're gonna um, really focus on Sonic Bible, really getting into and understanding uh, the King James Version and you know what that entails and really understanding why this book was made and what this really is and it's 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 everything it's everything i mean i wish i could have begin with this you know from the jump but um as you'll see you know it takes so much you know information outside and inside the bible to put all these pieces together to come to this series that we're about to get into now to really break down and give you the understanding of the bible and what it's really talking about so let's jump into this thing so with genesis starting out what they have effectively done when you get it and as i as i said you'll understand some things that we talked about already and touched on in previous videos but now you're going to see how it all comes together so when you get into the creation story of genesis what they did basically when they wanted to give us a creation story was piggyback off of the ancient Kemet, uh, ancient Egyptian creation story as we touched on. But as you got, um, as they got closer uh, and got more knowledge and understanding about, you know, science and everything like that, you know, it was changed, which is why the King James Version is what it is and everything is different. Now, we can't go back to the fourth century BCE or we can't go back even, yeah, let's just say the fourth century or go back to the, the first Tanakh or Torah, what have you, and see exactly how Genesis was. This is something we can't do. We can't do it with the Dead Sea Scrolls because they won't release it to us. We can't see if it started out in the beginning. Now, to me, uh, when they created the King James Version and they coded it, you know, everything that was put in that book, the King James authorized version was that version for a reason because the King James Version, as I said, was for them to break down and decode and what's in it is their agenda. But not only that, it's the true hidden story of what has happened on this planet given to us in parables. And the only way you can sort of decipher it is if you start looking at real history and understanding what took place. So the science aspect, when they give us in the beginning, talking about space, the pitch blackness, of creation out in space and you have you know God speaking and when you get into the frequency we're gonna be doing this touching in and out of previous DVDs another reason why I released all the videos if you've seen them this is going to make a lot more sense to you you'll be really caught up but as we talked about in energy and frequency DVDs about pitch blackness in the beginning you know, so you had words speaking. God said, let there be light, so on and so forth. And it's just giving you consciousness, creating this energy and vibration and frequency, which is what brings things into physical existence from energy to the elements, to, to elements, uh, to atoms, to elements, to give us these different particles or what have you that's going to make up the matter and everything else, everything that we talked about. So it's giving you that subtly in Genesis. And then you have the main thing, which is the first creation story in Genesis 1, when God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And I broke that down and I told you guys about how this is where you have our true essence, the true, our true essence and what we really are outside of this physical form, which is both masculine and feminine energy so in genesis when it's talking about let us make man in our image after our likeness it is just the creator our energy the creator speaking to itself plain and simple so it says male and female created he them and as i pointed out he is gender neutral that was well known back in the um 17th century 19th century 18th century everybody knew he was gender neutral they just x that out after the 1800s to where you know we, we was left confused so he is gender neutral so when it's saying he created man in his image in the image of god, god created he him male and female created he them so it's basically saying the essence our true energy created you know this is the creation of our soul, our energy, what we are from that energetic 
uh, feel down to just us coming into physical existence and us being split plain and simple so when you're getting into this in Genesis 1 this is what it's talking about just the creation of the heavens and the, uh, the earth without really getting too much in detail and the creation of our spiritual energy and from that spiritual energy how we was then formed into uh, flesh into man and women as it's given us in uh, Genesis 2. So Adam being formed or man being formed from the dust of the ground, alluding to us being made of space dust and God breathing into his nostrils the breath of life, symbolic of the soul or dualistic energy being put into physical form, which again, they got from Kanun, fashioning man on the potter's wheel and the whole uh, soul breath uh, analogy from ancient Kemet. Again, we see it clear as day in ancient Kim where a lot of this stuff is coming from. But at the same time, the science behind it all as well, when getting into the whole metaphor of atom being, you know, an atom. Adam is the atom, as I talked about. Eve, which means before, it's just alluding to the splitting of atom. Atoms have ribs. So, you know, Eve coming from Adam's rib is just basically saying, uh, you know, the rib of an electron orbiting the nucleus of an atom or what have you is a rib that orbit is a rib and that's what basically give you know the creation of the first being which would be woman so as saying eve which means before came before man first being on this planet is a woman not a man when you understand what it's talking about metaphorically so just touch it on this stuff because it's going to lead into a lot of stuff that we haven't talked about but we got to get through this as well but you have this story, creation story, and man being created, and then us, you know, being on the earth and everything is all well and good. And then we have, we know what happens with the uh, Garden of Eden story with the serpent and everything like that. As I broke down, being metaphorical, speaking about the separation, the fall of man to the lower brain. And uh, does it really give us what happened with that whole thing but later on in the bible it does which we'll touch on of course so we understand again the serpent coming into the garden and tempting eve which eve would, rep would represent the uh the negative energy you know she's the yin there's also so much more that we can point to uh, as far as eve and the woman pointing to the serpent as i talked about in ancient kemet in the queen's chamber of the great pyramid when you look at the the direction that it's pointing through through the little opening uh, from the queen's chamber that line is pointing directly to the constellation of draco and we know the other from the king's chamber is pointing to uh sirius so you have it's given us as i talked about the high and low hemispheres of the brain, which the pyramid represents the brain. You have the upper and lower hemispheres of the brain, king and queen's chamber, the woman, which will represent the uh, reptilian lower brain, pointing to the Draco constellation and the um, in space, and that is lower brain, and then the higher brain pointing to Osiris or Sirius or Orion, which is why you have Osiris combining Sirius and Orion together to give us that higher brain. So, bam, we have it right there. And then the crazy part about all that is that's actual anatomy. That's, that's our brain. So, in the Great Pyramid, as I talked about, we have them showing us that way back in ancient Kemet, how the uh, Great Pyramid is giving us the brain, higher and lower hemispheres pointing to space for very very crazy reasons what you're going to get into i'm telling you this is deep you <laughs> this is good right here when everything comes together from this series when it's all done you're gonna be masters that's all i can say you're gonna really get it all because i couldn't be where i'm at if i didn't give you all this if i didn't get all this information that i'm about to put out in this entire series which is going to take a while but it's gonna be well worth the time i couldn't know what i know this is going to just kind of answer as we go through a lot of questions it's going to show you a lot of different things and it's 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 just going to really open a lot of doors in your research as far as why they made this book and why you need to know it plain and simple because if you don't it's 
you're going to get stuck in so many different places. And, and I feel like, you know, when I get so many questions, I just be saying to people like, damn, if you read this in the Bible, if you understood what it was saying, you would get a lot more things. But again, this book is tricky. You know, it's hard for people to, to read it. I mean, people just can't sit and read it and it puts people to sleep. And, you know, <laughs> I have to do this and break it down this way because without getting this information, you're not going to go far. You're going to be stuck in so many different things. And, and so many people have said this, but I can't imagine getting to where I'm at without this book and knowing what the hidden stuff in this book is about. So this is what we're going to be getting into. So even a serpent is just representing where we fell from us having full control of the brain to just being subject to the lower brain. And then the God, which when you begin to understand, let's get this out of the way right now, is not good. God in the Bible is not good as you all know already. When that God, which is really representing the powers that be, when you really understand, as we'll get into, that God accomplishing exactly what it wanted to. That's basically what it is. One, we went from not understanding, and this is another huge thing I got to put out there, because when you understand metaphorically what's taking place in the garden, you basically have, and it's giving you that concept of a powerful being with knowledge, knowing something that man does not know, and using man to get work done, to do things, controlling man for a while until something happened and man got understanding of what was going on. And then every, the, whole, the whole relationship changed between this God and man. So what did man, what did God do? Since he can't destroy them, when you really understand what it's talking about in Genesis, he cast them away. Because, I mean, what would you do? If you were God and you really, because you got to remember one, God for some reason is in fear of Adam and Eve getting the tree of life. If you was that much in fear to cast them out of the garden, put uh, guards there with flaming swords, why not just get rid of them in the first place? Why not just kill them? Get rid of them, start all over. Why would you put them out there in this sin? You get what I'm saying? Because just like Star Wars would give you the understanding, if you strike me down, become more powerful than you ever can imagine, which is what you need to understand with that metaphor. If he kills them, they get everything. They know already. It's all, it's a done deal. You know what I'm saying? So he can't really kill them anyway. So it's the metaphor. He cast them out, hoping that through their lifetime, through, through what they go through, they never inquire or come back in contact with that tree. And as long as he got, got guards there, don't got to worry about that. So you begin to understand as we go through the Bible more what the point is. As I said in Saturn Satan, we got all these books telling us about all these different stories and everything else. When everything we needed to know was right there in Genesis telling us we got the tree of knowledge already. We know we need to figure out a way to get that tree of life. And it's much deeper than, you know, just Jesus and everything else. There's a lot more to this stuff. As you will see. So in Genesis, it's basically giving us that, you know, creation and understanding that something happened. We was created, something was happened to where we was changed, and then we continue on with the story. But you gotta understand before we go any further that, you know, one of the reasons, the whole thing and the uh, whole point of giving us the King James Version and basically making it for Freemasonry is to get it in control to get religion in control one of the things they had to make sure survive was their doctrines their book whether you realize this or not without religion they could not be in power they would not be where they are today if not for religion we still have today as we all know so many people that fear and revere the bible and the devil and jesus and what have you that causes men to act a different way. That changes everything. When you have a person in a position of power that believe in a biblical religion and you have the people behind the biblical religion controlling the person in power. And with things like that, you can get a lot of stuff done, which, which is even more dangerous is having the people believe in the same thing. Because then that's it. The people are believing exactly what's in the book. The Mason's job is to basically understand all this know what's going on know the purpose of the religions and what it's in place for and keep it going this is why we know you have doctors lawyers scientists
people in high ranking positions in military and government or what have you in this secret society as Masons because these are the people who are going forward and making, making sure things are being done in the name of the book, the, the deception, the religion. The people behind the cloak, the people that's running. You get what I'm saying? So they're making sure they're out there. People in these positions that's making these rules and making things pop. They masons, 100 percent. And they making thing, making sure things run according to the doctrine and the people that's controlling the doctrine. It's everything. So when you get that, there is a fidelity. There is a there is a you know a loyalty you must have to the religion because the religion is running things. You can get things done based on religion. We done fought so many wars because of religion. All this stuff going on in the Middle East is because of religion. Think about it. All the wars, the explosions and the babies being killed, all the bombings and shootings, so-called 9-11 and everything that's been happening. It's religion. You have people, you know, running these countries based on a religion that's created by men. You have millions of people over there in the Middle East doing what they are doing, living their life because of this religion. It's the same thing in every other country that is religious. It's ruling the world, whether you see it or not. It's so far out there and it's been going on for so long. And seemingly we see people forsake their religion and go against it all the time. But you gotta understand on the forefront, it's controlling everything and that you know even though time passed the people that's in power got there because of the religion plain and simple it's the same reason why you know people still put their hands over their heart and pledge allegiance and say all these oaths and uh, uh you know star spangled banner uh uh all the national anthem why people uh, uh put their hand on the bible and church the biggest one right there that should tell you right there something is up with that book that you still use it today you know, when we you in a court of law that has to do with truth, everything in that court has to do with proof, truth, facts or what have you. If you don't have it, you lose. You can't prove your case. It's over. And you putting your hand on a book, the irony of putting your hand on a book that is not backed by any proof. It's just it's bonkers. That tells you that it's the people behind it that's running the whole show. So all this stuff starts to coincide when you begin to understand how much is immersed in this book and how it all filters down into masonry and how these people are using it to control everything. You see what, why this secret society must exist. So we're going to look at the book and understand the Masonic belief and the Masonic teaching from the Masonic Bible and understand sort of kind of what, you know, they gravitate towards, what it's really all about. And of course it's coded, you know, and I mean, you can read right through it when you really understand what it's saying. So it's saying here, you have a Masonic creed as an expression of the simplest form of the faith of Masonry, not exhaustive, but incontrovertible and suggestive. The following is the Masonic belief. There is one God, the father of all men. The Holy Bible is the great light in masonry and the rule and guide for faith and practice. Man is immortal. Character determines destiny. Oh, that's a big one. Love of man is next to love of God. You're not going to walk into many churches and find a preacher that's going to say that because that's putting man next to God. It didn't say man is above or below. It says man, love of man is next to love of God for a reason. Why? Because man is God. Woman is God. So love of man is next to love of God. Man's first duty. Prayer. Communion of man with God is helpful. Recognizing the impossibility of Confining the teaching of masonry to any fixed forms of expression, yet acknowledging the value of authoritative statements of fundamental principles, the following is proclaimed as the Masonic teaching. Masonry teaches man to practice charity and benevolence, to protect chastity, to respect the ties of blood and friendship to adopt the principles and revere the ordinance of religion 
to assist the feeble, guide the blind, raise up the downtrodden, shelter the orphan, guard the altar, guard the altar, big one, support the government, support the government, big one, inculcate morality, promote learning, love man, fear God, implore his mercy and hope for happiness. Now, I've been to plenty of Masonic halls. I told you I have friends that are Masons who wish they were not Masons. <laughs> and um, I understand a lot of the practices and things that they are doing and what's going on in Freemasonry and how they elaborate more on, you know, what they teach and what they're talking about as far as the oaths and everything like that and how they basically saying subtly, you know, you better abide by what we teach and what we're talking about and understand how serious the oath is and how serious secrets are, which you'll you'll go through a whole learning experience about that. But they groom you for all that, you know, in school and uh, for people who go into these fraternities because you have to, have to be, you know, smart to even get in and have a certain GPA. So if you can, you know, control and have your uh, grades in order, you can do well. Uh, at the same time as being in a fraternity, then you can do well later on in a secret society in business and, you know, being able to follow the oaths and keep up with your duels and everything else. But all this is to perpetuate the existence of the Bible and how it is in play in our very society every day and how they must, in their positions that they are in, keep that going. So masonry, Freemasonry, is to, again, really keep and perpetuate the business of religion and the control of religion over everything else all the time, period. It's everywhere. And God we trust on the back of the dollar, understanding what that God really is and what it really represents. So they have to keep this charade of religion going, which is why the Pope is going to make his rounds. That has to keep going. You have to keep uh, this whole, you know, guessing game of religion going for as long as they can. Now we can slowly see uh, Catholicism, Christianity slowly switching into spirituality and um, how they begin to incorporate uh, biblical things into spirituality, into consciousness. They're trying to slowly do it, talking about it because eventually it's going to come out and they're going to say it. You already had popes and uh, bishops talk about how, you know, the Bible is just a metaphor. You know, it's a metaphor for this. But what they're going to be able to do later, and they'll be able to get a lot of people with this if they do it. What they're going to be able to do later, because I'm basically going to show you this in this series, they're going to be able to go right into the Bible and break it down and switch it into spirituality and say to you, we gave you the truth in the Bible and the preachers got it wrong or the preachers didn't preach it right. And um, it wasn't for everybody to understand until the time was right. But we gave it to you because they gave it to us. I don't care what nobody say or tell you. The truth is in the Bible, just not on the surface. And that's one of the conflicts that I have with a lot of people, how I glorify at the same time, bash at the Bible. I bash it, you know, mainstream media wise or mainstream wise, as far as how we was taught and how we grew up learning it and people believe believing the book on the surface versus breaking down the book and understanding the parable that Jesus is talking about in the book and the parable of the entire book and that is leading us back to uh, ancient Kemet and really getting us to try to understand what it's all about. So they're going to eventually be able to do that and show that um, consciousness and you know science and everything was always in the book. And later on, it's going to blow people away. It's going to blow people's mind. Just how these, how these um, Hebrews went into the Bible and pulled out Deuteronomy and broke that down with it having to do with us and thinking it was written so long ago before, you know, uh, slavery and everything like that and them being fascinated by it now, you know, that was written, you know, 16th, uh, 17th century still, you know, even though it was written around the time slavery was going on, a lot of this stuff came to pass, but we, as I talked about, was just basically them, the Masons who is in control of everything, fulfilling their agenda. So what, the uh, Hebrews having it confused that, you know, they talked about us, the black people are going to be in a low state and we're not going to be right and we're going to forever be the servants of white man and everything like that. Well, yeah, the people who are who gave you this book are still in power and they are the ones who are in these positions of power, making sure this is fulfilled because this is their guidebook. Plain and simple. This is what they're going off. This is the agenda right here. 
best place to hide something is in plain sight. It's right here. Everything. So again, for people who's, who be saying, we're going to get into this about the prophecies coming true and everything like that. Of course, it's right here. The same people that's fulfilling this stuff is the same people that put it there. And when they came up and gave us this book, all it was is the plan that they already set in order, you know, hundreds of years ago, them fulfilling it. So when you grasp that, you understand that what they want to do has been written a long time ago. And to my knowledge, only minor things have been changed because of us, but minor stuff. But Nothing has taken them off their main track, their main goal. They're right on track to win, to take over. And, um, you know, for my opinion, we don't start waking up. They will. And it's, it's nothing we can be able to do about it. But in getting back into this thing, all this stuff is going to come as we go along. It's a lot more stuff, you know, to get into as far as uh, make sure you in the Bible. But I wanted to touch on that first and get that out of the way because it's going to come up later and you'll understand, you know, why it's going to make sense. But. Going back, you know, understanding one talked about in uh, Genesis one about the firmament and how, of course, they got it from the temple of Hathor. When you go in there, you look up, you see the waters of noon. And that's what it's talking about as far as the firmament being water, the waters above the firmament and below the firmament, giving you that understanding of, you know, space, the heavens or what have you. That's another important thing I forgot to touch on. But remember that. You know, this is going to come up later and it's important for you to understand that in the beginning, why it was there, you know. So, I mean, it makes sense why it's in the beginning anyway, because you have the creation story. So it's talking about space. So that's a giveaway right there with the firmament being the waters of noon from the ceiling and the temple of Hathor talking about space. So it fits with the beginning and the creation story anyway. But we're going to come back to this now. Man being formed. Adam and Eve being cast out of the garden and basically gone about their business, living. And a lot of things, uh, of course, they leave out because it's a story leading to other things. One of the things you got to, again, understand at some point in time, other people was being created, you know, and we see later with uh, Cain marrying um, a woman and, you know, where did she come from? And they say it was... Uh, one of, the, one of his, his sister or something like that, but that doesn't fit as I broke down. And uh, it's, it skips. It's so much space and time that it's skipped in the Bible that's giving us different points, and that's for a reason. We're going to get into that. I'm going to be saying it a lot, but you'll see as we go. It'll all come together. But um, it fits. So we have that. Let's just skip through all that, you know, the whole uh, Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, uh, and all the people that begot them and everything like that. As I talked about metaphorically, it's just giving you the creation story of us and then giving you the story to basically kind of get you to a certain point. So Noah's Ark, you have the creation of people and, and man on the planet doing a bunch of things. And then we get to Noah's Ark. But you got to understand what took place before that and what it's really talking about when it's talking about the sons of God coming into the daughters of men. And what that whole thing is really about. Now, one of the reasons why it got into the whole uh, sons of God coming into the daughters of men and about the race of giants is because they knew, you know, even back then, they knew about the giants on the planet. They knew that there was proof. They knew that the ancient civilization spoke of giants. I showed you guys in ancient Kemet about the, you know, the hieroglyphs when it's basically kind of giving you depictions and the oppression of giants. They understood this. And one of the things that they always do is they always cover their ass. So they can use the whole giant thing to basically fall into, uh, to get people to fall into their whole scheme of the Bible, which we see that's what happens. Whenever somebody finds anything pertaining to giants, it always goes to the Nephilim and goes into, you know, the fallen angels or what have you. But it's just them really covering up for the fact that giants was on the planet. And it has nothing to do, of course, with anything biblical. It's just these race of giants or whoever these beings are that was here existed. And they know the proof that they existed is out there and it's going to be coming up. And they don't know when some government or some person might stumble upon something 
that uh, it's going to prove without a shadow of a doubt that they can't control that the Giants, in fact, existed or, you know, was real. But a lot of that is already out there, as you probably already seen. So that's just one part of it. Now, the part that worries me the most about, you know, that whole thing in Genesis, because it implies a lot, which we'll touch on as we go. It implies too many things about basically telling you and giving you the understanding that beings came from space to the planet and somehow, you know, we get the, um, it's going to make a lot of sense later. <laughs> we get the impression of mating. That's how they just give it to us outright. Came into the daughters of man and basically had sex and the women bear these giants. And it's another way of looking at it when you dig deeper into the book of Enoch, which we'll touch on that, in, you know, a little, maybe later on, but not right now. It does fit now, but you'll, you'll understand later. But it's touching on a lot. What is touching about that? When it's talking about that, because it's implying too many different things that will fit later, but it's it's big. It's one of the only things that worries me about all of this, and we'll I'm gonna touch on that later because it's like, you know, just one look at the whole thing about God. You go into the Book of Enoch explanation of basically these beings define God coming to earth and having sex with the women and doing what they're doing and basically the earth getting out of control to the point where God destroys it. So you have to look at that and say, oh, come on. Now, you know God exists. If you knew he was real and he created you and he has these outrageous powers, he can do anything, why would you mess up? Why would you do anything to the point where he can, he has the power to destroy everything you've done and you? You know, so the story about these fallen angels coming down and doing something they ain't supposed to do against a being of all power or what have you don't make sense. It does not fit. But from my research and everything I've been talking about through my videos, as I said, there was a war. Something happened. And this is what it's alluding to in Genesis when it's talking about God destroying the earth with a flood. But the part that people is forgetting is how technologically advanced that civilization was before this. Now, it's only hitting and alluding to it in certain points. But when you really grasp what it's saying, we're talking about a civilization that existed on this planet that was amazing, that was advanced. Now, the Bible in uh, certain points is going to give you them, you know, being evil, monsters, what have you. Same thing in the book of Enoch, but the book of e Enoch is the most in giving away uh, the, uh, the advancement of these people. And um, we see this. We see this advanced civilization and them basically going against power, whoever's in power or God or what have you, and then everything being destroyed with a flood, which is, you know, when you get into the whole Noah's Ark story. So we know, you know, something happened on this planet and then it was washed away. And that's basically what it looked like. It was planted with scorched with fire and then water. And it's basically what it seems like happened. And some survived. You know, you have Noah's Ark where it's telling you that everybody was wiped out except him and his family, which when you really get into it, you know, uh, was talking about the bloodline of him and everything like that. Basically saying it could have been, you know, let's say humans and other kinds of beings on this planet. And then everybody else was taken away or wiped out except for the humans, which is, which is what it's really alluding to. It said everybody who was here besides humans was here. Something happened. And or you could just even say different species is no longer here. Who knows? But we know they were all wiped out and gone except for us. This race. This is what it's talking about. This is what fits with everything else. We look at the planet. We look at, you know, what's here. And we look at the fact that it seems as if everything just picks up from ancient Kemet. And, you know, we know we can go back and we look at the time frame of that. And we know those pyramids are old, but it's giving you, you know, uh, basically something that happened and kind of give you, we're going to touch on this in a second, but kind of giving you an understanding of what took place. But you have... Noah's Ark, you have these people coming out, you have all this destruction that happened, and then all of a sudden you find you have man basically trying to recreate or, you know, live out after this destruction. So, you know, skip all the hoopla, Noah's Ark happened, whatever like that, 
and then you know the Bible according to the Bible and then you have you know the uh, sons of, of uh, Noah and everything and them basically going out and multiplying and the whole story of Ham, Shem, and Japheth or what have you and basically alluding to the uh, reestablishment or man basically reestablishing himself uh, on the planet and going out and spreading and multiplying or what have you. But it's interesting. Skip all of he begot who and he begot him or what have you. And you get to eventually Abraham. So who will become Abraham later on. So you get to Abraham uh, in Genesis. And it just comes out with the story. And eventually it just basically stops. It stops with the genealogy. And it gives you Genesis uh, 11, 1 through 9, which I talked about a few times where you had man basically reestablishing himself. So when it's talking about in Genesis about, you know, man becoming, being of one speech, it's really getting into uh, man after the flood, reestablishing civilization and being one and everything is fine and well and good. This is after the whatever happened. And it's sort of alluding to a little bit some of the things that it's talking about. So, you know, when it's saying... Genesis 11, 1, you know, the whole earth uh, was of one language and one speech, you know, and it came to pass as they journeyed from east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, go to let us make brick. Now, I broke this down in an earlier video about how when you take this stuff back to Hebrew, how it's giving you a different story. And it's important because it all really fits in now when you begin to understand what it's talking about. So it's talking about the civilization. And when you start breaking it back, it gives you the different story about how people was united. They was of one accord, one speech. They was united. They, was had, they had unity. They was doing something. And everything was fine and dandy until something caused them to move from where they was to go to a place that was like Sheol or hell. So as I talked about in that uh, earlier video about how they left, I was giving you sort of a, a, a allusion to something that happened. So they was made to go. And it's basically talking about the Africans going into Kemet, which, as I talked about before, the pyramids was already there. And they was trying to rebuild them or reconstruct them in order to um, basically accomplish something. So when you start to break down the story, you have Africans basically coming out of this catastrophe, going up into Kemet and trying to remember, trying to reestablish civilization and understand what happened, what took place. And as it's giving you when Genesis is saying, you know, whoever is in charge, which I will say the powers that be, basically you know, confounded their speech. But what's interesting is, you know, when it's talking about, as I said, uh, uh, make brick, when you break it down, it means be white. So the word for brick is law ban. And law ban means be white. Doesn't really seem like much on the surface until you understand that when you get into start getting into the story and get into the Tower of Babel, and it's talking about how the Lord came down to see this the, uh, tower in the city in which the the uh, the, uh, the children of men you know had built. So you have basically this God or the powers that be, whoever it's talking about, coming to see what they was doing, and this all goes and fits into the Book of Enoch because we're talking about the Tower of Babel. We're talking about the uh, children of of you know. The so-called fallen angels, the post that came down, have been doing all this stuff in the book of Enoch. But when you understand on the surface what it's saying, it's talking about men, Africans, doing something, recreating to me, from my research, recreating the pyramids, trying to rebuild and figure out the past and um, basically get off this planet in my understanding. We will touch on this later. But... um. Then when you get into the biblical understanding of how they're trying to switch it up, because they're taking that story and giving you uh, this being because they because they did this or because they was trying to do this, this somehow being the reason why, you know, they had to be stopped or they had to send in the white man to basically infiltrate and change all this. As I said, when you start reading through the story, 
and um, you start deciphering it and switching it back to Hebrew, it's talking about let us go down there and infiltrate, uh, infiltrate them and, you know, confound their speech or what have you. So it's giving you that. But again, this going into the book of Enoch. And when you start getting into the book of Enoch, coming right out of the Noah's Ark story, we understand, you know, when Noah was born, it's white. And, you know, to everybody else, that's so what? But when you read in the story, it's giving you clear as day that his parents was black, clearly, or else they wouldn't be so shocked. So when you go into the book of Enoch, let me just read this. It's saying, after a time, my son Methuselah took a wife for his son, Lamech. She became pregnant by him and brought forth a child, the flesh of which was white as snow and red as a rose, the hair of whose head was white like wool and long and whose eyes were beautiful. When he opened them, he illuminated all the house like the sun, the whole house abundant with light and when he was taken from the hand of the midwife, opening also his mouth, he spoke to the Lord of righteousness. Then Lamech, his father, was afraid of him and flying away, came to his own father, Methuselah, and said, I have begotten a son unlike to other children. He is not human, but resembling the offspring of the angels of heaven is of a different nature from ours being all together unlike us. So again, understand, you know, if you have Noah supposedly being this white man and then the flood happens and you have Noah's offspring basically reestablishing civilization, you know, where's the black man and all this? Clearly it's telling you Noah wasn't black in the book of Enoch. And it's one of the reasons why I was taken out of the Bible, because that gives away too much. And I've told you about how uh, the creator or the person who gave us the uh, book of Enoch uh, was a Mason and how he went into Ethiopia and just came back out of nowhere uh, with these three manuscripts that nobody could find. You know, prior, he just comes out of nowhere with three, not one, but three uh, book books of Enoch that supposedly the Ethiopians had all this time. But clearly they didn't because nobody could find one. So, again, the story was given to us for a reason, for many different things. And, you know, they're going to probably try to say uh, if they're going to use this stuff biblically, because they lose in that fight, by the way, this whole biblical thing. What they wanted to do, which we'll touch on, because they had a whole entire plan for this book that has been basically scrapped because of so much information uh, uh, coming out, which is one of the reasons why they have to get rid. I told you, I told you guys, they got to get rid of the Internet. All this shit is going to be gone. And for you people who buy this stuff and who's starting to get it, you're going to have this information. Nobody else is going to have it. The people who ain't getting it not going to have this stuff. This shit will be gone. Do you think they're going to let, they, let us keep doing this for, forever? No, because we hurting too much. This information is going to be gone because there's no way they can move forward with this kind of information being out there. They're going to get rid of it and they're going to let generations pass. This is the MO. They're going to let generations pass without this information and without access to it. It's just going to be gone and wiped out from everywhere. And whoever have it and have the knowledge to pass down to their children, they're going to be the only ones who know it. So it's, it's, it's really important to get this stuff. But one of the goals um, for them was to make it as if you see us talking about Noah being basically white and resembling the, uh, the angels from heaven, which according to them, is white. And then you have uh, Gaia, Gaia. You have people like them and other people trying to give you these extraterrestrial white-looking beings to try to give you the connection with the fallen angels and how they looked. So you also have people saying, okay, well, it's talking about in the book of Enoch, it's, it's telling you about you know Noah being white and having hair like wool. Who else had hair like wool? Jesus, according to the description in the Bible. So you have that argument as well. You know, they try to make those comparisons. You see what they're doing. This is really subtle, but they're going to eventually try to bring this thing all together. And in a later later generations that will be born into or you guys will be born into those who don't make it. And this information that we're talking about is going to be gone. Plain and simple. So then they could just come out with this information and make it as if because that Bible ain't going nowhere make it as if uh, they're going to put themselves biblically 
into positions of power. I told you how the Rothschilds wanted to come out in the year 2000 and try to make it as if their bloodline is the bloodline of Jesus Christ and everything like that. But again, too much information has gotten out and they, they couldn't do it. So understand what I'm saying, how all this is fitting. So, you know, from one one point, they kind of sort of making it like they created the white race to be in opposition to African people because uh, we was getting too far. And that's basically what it's saying when you try to break it down. But at the same time, giving you another story about how you had this technologically advanced civilization that was destroyed for whatever reason. And you had the flood. And again, you got to ask yourself the question if Noah is white. And then you have the uh, offspring of Noah, who is supposedly, you know, they should, they should look like him. They shouldn't be like um, the original people, you know, uh, who would be Noah's family, who was, and everybody else who was all wiped out. But again, I uh, remember, uh, Noah supposedly had the pure bloodline, which is why he was spared. So his family should have the same pure bloodline because it's the line he came from. So we can't say, you know, cause, cause that's kind of, that's what throws it off. Cause remember the whole reason why Noah was chosen is because he had the pure bloodline. The whole reason why Noah was chosen is because he had the pure bloodline. So if Noah supposedly had the pure bloodline or was untainted by what, what everybody else uh, was going through and wasn't affected by what everybody else was going through, you know, how could he be pure if he came out completely not like his parents? So how was Noah perfect in his generation? Was he perfect because he was the first albino or was he the first white person? Think about it. We're talking about metaphors here with Genesis. The flood, we know it happened for real on this planet. Not like Genesis is telling us as far as everybody dying. We know people had survived. So if you look at it metaphorically as saying Noah, we know coming from black people, what them saying is we know white folks come from black folks, but this Noah was white, just like we know the albinos and white people come from black folks. So him being perfect in his generation is like them saying he is perfect because he is the first white person. Plain and simple. Now go into the bloodline and we can look at, you know, Ham, Shem and Japheth as them basically saying they would be the racist coming from the true bloodline of the original man, which would be, you know, the Africans. So again, the book of Enoch was taken out for a reason. It's separate because it raises too many questions when you try to compare with the Bible itself and compare it to, you know, what's going on. But they gave us that for a reason for you to decipher it and put it in context. But getting back into Genesis 11, one through nine, the whole story, these people wasn't doing nothing wrong. Plain and simple. And to have God supposedly come down there, compound his speech and scatter them and everything like that. And it's like, you know, for what? These people was, there was no threat. You're supposed to be God almighty. What are you afraid of that these people are supposed to be doing? What's going on? So another thing to look at. So supposedly they were scattered. And uh, when you get back into the Bible, next thing you know, of course, we're talking about uh, Abraham. And he will eventually, you know, go where? So just think about everything that's happening now. You have the creation of man, right? You have uh, civilization on a planet that's advanced, being wiped out and destroyed. You have civilization regaining strength and coming together and doing whatever. And then you have uh, Abraham. You have this whole story of him. The first place this dude goes, you know, Supposedly, according to the Bible, he goes into the land of Canaan and um, God promised him, you know, his generations, you know, this land and everything like that. But famine breaks out. You know, why would God give you some land and freaking famine breaks out? You know, kind of powerful God does that. But where does this dude go? Egypt. So, you know, the whole story of Abraham going into Egypt, bringing his wife and him telling his wife, hey, I'm going to tell everybody that you're my sister. Because I don't want them to kill me over you. I want to go there and they'd be like, well, damn, you, you know, 
your wife fine as hell. We're going to kill you and take her. So I'm going to say you my sister. And then, you know, the Pharaoh wanted her. And then plagues fell on Egypt because God was pissed that his wife was with the Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh was like, yo, take your wife. Why you tell us it was your sister? Take her and get out of here. And they left with all this gold and cattle and everything like that. But it's giving you that connection with Kemet early in Genesis. A lot of people don't understand that. You know, it's not just, you know, we get into Exodus that we get into Kemet. Early in Genesis, we get into Kemet. So it gives you that connection. It's talking about later on when we get towards the end, how the new Pharaoh did not know Abraham or Abraham and had that connection and understand who he was. So he's seen him as a threat. You know, these people are going to take over everything. We got to get rid of these people. These people are a threat straight up. And, you know, the whole enslavement supposedly ensued. So, again, one of the things uh, we can find a suspect in the Bible anyway is how they do not. They give us a pharaoh of Egypt. We're talking about how great and unbelievable Egypt uh, was. And then the Bible being this book that's supposedly giving us this information and knowledge does not go into Kemet, does not go deeper into who these pharaohs was how the civilization of Kemet was established, uh, not even the building of the pyramids or mentioning the pyramids, which is weird. And then also, we don't get no full understanding of Hebrews as far as the beginning. So we can go from what they're telling us now about, you know, Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, whatever like that, the uh, tribes and everything. But we get the first mention mention of Hebrew in Genesis uh, 14, 13. We don't get the first mention of Jew until uh, 2 Kings uh, 6, 16. Now also using numerology, we can get the numbers 13 and nine from both those numbers with uh, 14, 13 uh, given us when you add it together, you get uh, one and four, which will give you five, and you get one, give you six, plus three, give you nine. Then with 2 Kings, you do multiplication, you get 6 times 1 is 6, and 6 times 6 is 36, 3 and 6 is 9. In both cases, you get a 6 and a 3 to give us 9, but also with uh, the 2 Kings, if you add 616, it'll give you 13. So this is going to come up a lot with these numbers as we'll touch on as we go, and why they are important and why they are in many different places. As you'll see, I'm going to try to get through all of them if possible, but we know. It's not talking about no Hebrews, no origin story of the Egyptians, not really getting into it. Just all of a sudden, in Genesis 14, 13, it's talking about Abraham, the Hebrew. And then he would eventually go into Egypt again. Another story with Egypt and his wife and him taking the, uh, the uh, maid as a, as a wife or, you know, getting her pregnant and everything like that. That whole story. So we have a whole nother story in Kemet. You have these stories that they're talking about in the Bible that the Egyptians are not talking about themselves and them again trying to interject themselves into ancient Kemet uh, before everything happened and try to make that comparison. But again, the first civilization is attaching itself onto its ancient Egypt, which is why when we come out of uh, when you leave, when Genesis is in and off, it's in and off with them and Kemet going into the book of Exodus. But what Genesis has given us again, the creation story of us, how we came about, how we came into existence and given us in parable the destruction of the civilization that predates us. Now we're going to come back into Genesis as we go along and we'll do that with other books of the Bible as well as we'll go back and touch on previous verses to make the point in these uh, later verses. But with Genesis is straightforward, it's given us the creation of us. The fact that something happened on this planet, basically the creation of the white man. We're going to get back into that whole book of Enoch thing. I don't want, to, want you to think I forgot about it. It just don't, it don't go yet. But you have to, again, we can't leave it out. We can't look at, we can't discount what it's telling us about the sons of God coming into the daughters of man and what that whole thing is really about. So it's giving you everything that basically took place that we don't know, that we don't have any real proof of, just they're alluding to. What happened before, you know, uh, the rise of the uh, dynasties of ancient Kemet, which would eventually arise. And it seems like civilization began with them. So Genesis is giving us this story. And then we get into Exodus, which is giving us another false story with parables. But all of it is going to eventually lead us to the fall 
of Egypt, parabolized, of course, and the rise of their power, which is basically what it's talking about. And we, we can't forget in the mix of it all in Genesis, uh, giving us the Greek mythological stories as far as uh, Pandora's box, I touched on that. When we get into Greek mythology part two DVD series, we're gonna get more into that. But um, talked about it, Pandora's box, even the apple, uh, through Kaleon and Pharaoh, Noah's Ark and all that stuff like that. Those comparisons as well. So not only are they trying to give us what happened before the rise of the dynasties, but they're interjecting their own uh, Greek mythology into it as well in different places. And, you know, this is what Genesis is about. Now, one of the things we got to remember is that they are trying to, in Genesis, establish this faulty history for the Jews. So you got to really pay attention to what the Bible was saying and then compare it to the so-called Jewish history. You know, the reason they give behind the establishment of Israel for a nation. And it goes really beyond the Bible, which we'll get into. But... You got to remember when we're looking at it and reading, you know, they give us Hebrew, but they never really tell us where Hebrews come from. Just call, you know, Abraham the Hebrew and never really gives you a give you a real history of the Hebrew people or why they call Hebrews. Or, you know what that really does mean uh, in the beginning of Genesis. It's just out of nowhere. We get Hebrews. So you also got to understand that, you know, when they when they wrote the King James Version, they were establishing this history like they already had the plan laid out of what they wanted to do and already was implement implementing the plans uh, for a long time. But, you know, with the King James Version, they had to really uh, establish this faulty history to kind of sort of make up for the history that they was going to be uh, giving us with the uh, Arabs as well as the Jews. So. One of the things you'll see, and a lot of people understand this already, is when you have uh, Abraham, Abraham being basically promised Israel in the Bible, you know, his his seed, his generations, his offsprings or what have you, it's going to be promised Israel and everything like that. So what a lot of people don't realize is Abraham comes from Mesopotamia, which is basically Iraq. So a lot of people... Uh, don't understand the whole entire co conflict between the Arabs and the Jews as far as the whole Israel-Palestine thing. So in Genesis, it really starts to set the tone for that when you start to understand. So when you go and you read here, Genesis chapter 24, it says, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant, of the house of his house that ruled over all that he had put I pray thee thy hand under my thigh and I will make thee swear by the Lord the God of heaven and the God of the earth that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell so we know the Canaanites we know about Canaan we understand Abraham going into Canaan and Canaan being Israel so he's telling his servant not to take any wives for my son from Israel. But he says for him to go basically here. He says, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, part of venture, the woman will not be willing to follow me unto the land. So skip here. It says here, verse 10. And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. So it's one of the biggest issues in the Bible that people do not understand. Even in the beginning, when you talk about where the establishment, where the birthplace, we're talking about the ancestors, the beginning for the uh, the Jewish or the Hebrews starts with Abraham, you know, it starts with Abraham. So Abraham coming from Mesopotamia, not Israel. So what is so important about Israel? Now, again, when we go here and read in Genesis, and this is Genesis uh, chapter 11, verse 31. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, 
his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees, which Ur is in Iraq or Mesopotamia, to go into the land of Canaan, and they came into Haran and dwelt there. So one of the biggest things that a lot of people don't understand in Genesis is when it's giving you this history of the Hebrews or what have you, that they keep harping on, you know, Hebrews, the, the, the uh, Hebrew Israelites, Hebrews, uh, Egypt and God's covenant and everything like that. But you're talking about the seed of the Jews comes from Iraq. Think about that. The seed of the Jews comes from Iraq. The seed, the bloodline that would give us Jesus Christ, supposedly, comes from Iraq. So, I mean, what does that tell you? So this is one of the things that, you know, when you start to understand about the history of what's been going on with the Palestinians and the uh, the uh, people, the Israelites, the people from Israel, is uh, that whole thing. So you would have with the Quran them understanding that okay so we're talking about the abrahamic uh faiths originates from or you know where he was deemed to be worthy by god originates from uh mesopotamia iraq and has really not too much to do with israel so with the land being promised to his offspring his generations his seeds which would eventually of course be uh you know stemming from Iraq, this is one of the reasons why you have this biblical or this religious attachment that the Arabs have with uh, Palestine and with that area. But it's a lot more that went to that that's, you know, goes against, that's basically going off of the faith. But this is this is how they tie themselves into it uh, religiously. But you got to remember, remember, you had the whole war uh, that happened in um, Israel. And you basically had, I believe it was 1947, the U.N. step in between uh, Israel and the Arabs, uh, Palestine and Israel going at, going at each other fighting. And you had them basically separate the land and give, you know, the Jews, Israel and uh, the Palestinians, Palestine. But the Palestinians basically, or the, you know, the Arabs, they basically they couldn't accept that. They wanted all the land. So they basically attack Israel and, you know, they had a war. You know, with Israel, Israel won. So when Israel won that war, remember before it's, it's peace. OK, you got your land. We got our land. Y'all came and attacked us, supposedly. So what Israel did after they won was they basically took more lands from the Palestinians. And then they imposed all these laws and rules and everything on the Palestinians, not, not letting them live in certain places and not letting them, um, you know, really govern themselves and be governed by, you know, the uh, the Jews. So, you know, they've been rising up. So it's, it's been a war again where they rose up and you basically had uh, them lose again to the um, to Israel. And, you know, more land was taken and more freedoms was taken away from the Palestinians. So then you had, again, peace. And it seems like every time a leader arose in Palestine to try to make peace with the Jews, that leader was assassinated by the Palestinians. So they, they just didn't want peace. And they wanted basically to take all of Israel away from the Jews and to completely eradicate the Jews. But every time they tried, they kept getting beaten. And every time a leader arose to try to make that peace treaty, they did something to the leader. They even killed them or attack uh, Israel to basically end the peace. So this has been going on for a long time, but it stems from, you know, Genesis. But we also got to remember that this was the purpose for the Holocaust, for them to basically create a race, a nation for Israel to try to establish them as an actual legit people that is a nationality. And for everybody else, you know, you have heritage, you have history, you have artifacts, you have so many sacred places that we can go to that we have so much that can back up the history and the nationality of everybody else except for these Jews. The only place you're going to find anything for the Hebrews and the Jews is in the Bible and not in uh, ancient history. I mean, real, real ancient history, uh, of course, before for uh, 400 BCE. So now when you tie it all together, think about it. You have King James. We're talking about England giving us the King James Version. 
England giving us that Bible, right? So now, you fast forward. Remember, you will have eventually, and I talked about this in a previous video, about how the Rothschilds we know took over the Bank of England. They took the Bank of England. They were smart. They had that bank, and they eventually would rule. So we know it would be the Rothschilds who basically would put in place the royal family that we know of today. And we understand, remember, Queen Elizabeth, her husband, is what? He is the head of Freemasonry. He is the royal head of Freemasonry. Remember, King James was a Mason. Remember, who, who did he get to help him with the Bible? He got Francis Bacon, who was considered the father of Freemasonry. To basically help him out, you know, with the Bible. So we have all that connection. We have the Rothschild connection, everything. So remember when it was talking about Hitler and how, you know, where did he get his money from? Remember, Hitler's supposed to have kidnapped Baron Rothschild, let him go, but then took all the money from his bank. That was a cover up because they had to justify where was he getting the funds to fund this war? Who was funding Hitler? Where did the money come from? So we know he stole a lot from the Jews and everything like that, but that takes a lot of time to liquidate. He had to be getting liquid cash from somewhere. So that whole Rothschild scam was to cover up who he was. And the rumors have been out for a while that Hitler was a Rothschild. So you bring it full circle. Remember, what was Hitler's job? To establish Israel as a nation. That was the point of the Holocaust. So it's all coming full circle from the King James Version and its inception all the way up into the establishment of Israel, which we know is running things with Rome today because they are one and the same, plain and simple. So remember, the Greeks who are white folks are using the Jews to cover up who they really are, which Jews is Greeks. They're the same people. So after the Holocaust, 1947, as I said, the UN basically OK, we're going to make you a nation because they felt like not only should uh, Israel be a nation, but they should be a people. They should be recognized as a people, as a race, as, a, you know, Hebrews. It's not just a name, but for everybody else, as I said, we can establish that, but not for the Hebrews. We can't establish that at all. But that was the, one of the purposes for the Holocaust to try to match up the suffering of the Jews, the suffering of the Jews with biblical a nonsense, you might as well say. So that happened. And of course, the Arabs, once they took over that land after the Ottoman Empire fell in uh, World War I, you basically had them ever since then, you know, trying to establish this uh, this war and, and get the legitimacy of the Jews and the Hebrews established with the world on a global stage so everybody could, be, could recognize them. So because we're talking about, remember, you have now... How many years, you know, hundreds of years since we had the King James Version and them talking about these Hebrews and Jews. You, If you had the King James Version in the 1600s, you're reading about these Hebrews and Jews. But remember, you know, it's no TVs. You read about this stuff in the book. You're not really seeing it as much. And of course, they wanted to spread it as much as possible around the world to get the world familiar and to understand that a such thing as Jews and Hebrews exist. So when you read and you understand about all this conflict uh, with the Jews and Hebrews and then finally the war happens and you hear the world talking about these names, Jews, Hebrews, what have you. And them, you had a lot of people like, you know, they fulfilling this biblical prophecy and they, don't, they did all that to give relevancy to the Bible. So after the war was over, that's what they did. They established Israel as this nation. People went in there and uh, there has been conflict ever since because. The Palestinians didn't want to give up any part of the land to the um, to the uh, to the Jews. You had uh, Hamas be established and them basically going out and taking over shit. Remember, they basically took uh, Gaza and, um, you know, you had the wars back and forth with Gaza and uh, Israel so many times. Even still to this day, it's not really safe to be there. And it's been going on for a long time. And every time, as I said, somebody comes along and try to establish uh, a peace, they assassinate that person. So it seems like it's never going to be. They want to keep that conflict going with um, with Israel, with the Arabs, which is supposedly, if you go biblically, is going to lead up to something later on. But the whole point is, you know, how is everybody so wrapped up in this Hebrew thing 
when the bloodline for Jesus Christ comes from Mesopotamia. What is that? So, and that's something that um, you got to look at. You got to look at. And then from that, you got to go into the Quran, which we'll do in a couple of instances in this series because it's going to bring everything together. And um, you got to go into, into the Quran and, and see how their story goes versus the whole uh, story with the uh, Jews being promised that land. And it's just something as we've been seeing over the years, the Arabs is not going to allow them to have peacefully. So they continue to fight to this day. So they stuffed a whole lot in Genesis, as you can see, it's 50 chapters in Genesis. And it's a lot that they had to establish right up front. You know, we get the whole thing with the Hebrews in Genesis. We actually get the uh, first name Jehovah is mentioned in uh, Genesis 24, 13, I believe it is. And then it's a compound word mentioned in uh, Genesis. But then in Exodus, they give you Jehovah. So we get that. So we get the establishment of so many different things you get towards the end of Genesis, which we're going to get into is so much information and stories about the Egyptians. And it's one of the things that a lot of people got to understand. If you watch my whole series with the um, Greek mythology one and uh, everything I've been putting out with ancient history, volume one and two, as far as what the Greeks are doing, then you you'll get Genesis and what they're trying to do. So when you start getting into uh, Genesis, you, you uh, go through the whole Abraham bloodline thing with him dying off and giving us um, his uh, family and everything. You see what they basically doing, because one of the things you got to ask yourself when you start reading is how do they know all this stuff about the ancient Egyptians as far as the customs we're talking about right in the beginning uh, in Genesis, you know, they, they talking about the Egyptian customs and talking about going into, uh, Egypt a lot of times. So, you know, when we read Genesis 41, 57 says, and all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all lands. Chapter 39 uh, says Genesis. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Protipater, I should say, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptians. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him oversee over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. Now also when Joseph dies, says he's you know, he's embalmed and put in a coffin and buried in Egypt. So again, we have never found the body of Joseph in Egypt. Another thing is we know through Herodotus and through a lot of historians, the Egyptians was not tolerant of anybody's God or anybody's, you know, rules or anything, you know, any cultures or customs that other people was doing. It was all about them in the past, as I talked about. But again, you know, they're giving you this history. And when you start going through the end of Genesis and reading it, they're talking about this connection with them and the the ancient Egyptians to try to establish that connection. But what are we really talking about here? What does that really fit? When you go back and you go through the um, Saturn Satan series, when you go through when I was talking about with ancient history, we know what they're trying to give you in the end of Genesis is the connection between them and the Greeks, of course. So when you start to understand what they're talking about and establishing at the end of Genesis is their connection with the Egyptians. This is important to understand. It's them basically saying we're Hebrews, Jews basically being captive with the Hebrews, I mean, with the uh, Egyptians, but we really know it's them living in Egypt, being taken care of and taught by the Egyptians who they basically slandered their name and said, you know, they took us hostage and basically made us slaves. Well, we know they was in there being taught and being helped with so many different things. This is to establish that connection. We cannot in no way, nowhere find any proof that any Hebrews were slaves in ancient Kemet. It's bullshit. As I showed you, the glyphs that we see of people in chains and the black people that, that look like slaves are the Hyksos and the Egyptians themselves. When a Hyksos rule happened, it's them showing the Hyksos basically ruling 
and taking them as captives is one of the reason how, reasons how we know the ancient Egyptians was black because they depicted themselves as black prisoners in certain instances uh, in, uh, hier in hieroglyphs and the depictions and the reliefs. So that's what it is. So them in Genesis is giving you that establishment, that history of them being in Kemet. So what we take from Genesis, which we don't really have to get too, too deep into, is they're giving us the science of the understanding of how we came into existence when you break it down. The fact that they're giving it to you in that whole instance as far as uh, our masculine and feminine energy becoming into this reality, into this uh, physical world as just us being split, or uh, for us men, our feminine energy locked away and our subconscious and we are masculine, it's giving you the dual energy, the creation of us right there. And there's so many different things that a lot of people don't are not seeing uh, when we get into Genesis. Genesis uh, 9, 3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things, but fish with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And this is where people get confused because they don't understand. It says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Plain and simple. But then it says in four, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Sounds like a contradiction, right? Until you go to five and it says, and surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso shed of man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God may he man. In Genesis 9, 4, by flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. It just told you in 3, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. But it's saying, of course, don't eat people. Don't eat people. And it reiterates that in the Bible, which we'll get into. So it's a contradiction. It's one of those things, one of those things that they use to confuse people. It's telling you you can eat meat clearly. It's saying that. But then it's saying don't eat people, which we are meat. We are flesh, of course, as it's saying. If you kill a man, which God made man is saying, then, you know, it's going to require your life. Basically a metaphor. So a lot of people get into that. And that's one of the reasons, again, why they know. And it's one of the reasons why they put it in Genesis, because they know that they, the relief is there in, in Kemet of them preparing meat and them having that whole, it's on a relief too about them not eating man. The same thing is there. When I took that picture next to that relief in Kemet was to show you guys that it say the exact same thing. I didn't get the whole relief. I think I did, but um, I don't remember if I uh, showed you guys, but it's saying in the relief that one, this is how you prepare meat, but not to eat human meat. Of course, that's just something that they knew, but the Bible is reiterating it. The Bible is talking about Genesis I mean, talking about Kemet a lot. So it's fitting that they put that there. So as I was saying, you know, what Genesis has given us is the establishment, the beginning. And then what they picked up from ancient Kemet and what they stole and they basically sprinkling over Genesis along with Greek mythology. The first question people should ask themselves is, you know, the Egyptians, when you start reading Genesis immediately, and I'm talking about them, seemingly have everything. How is these Jews, the chosen people, then who are these Egyptians that they seem to have everything? Pharaohs. What's a pharaoh? They're not really giving you enough information. And I need to talk about the pyramids. So it tells you how we look in our uh, history today, how it seems as if everything began in Kemet. They are giving you that same analogy, that same story in the beginning of Genesis. And then as you'll see as we go on, is how they basically, these stories is fictional, people. Don't get caught up in these stories. A lot of the stuff they just stole, a lot of the stories they make up to try to reiterate or iterate rules and laws that they want to pass later on. It's a lot of just fictional stories that don't really mean nothing. It's just a bunch of bullshit. So don't really get attached too much to the stories, but you got to know when to pull stuff out and when to leave stuff alone. But the biggest thing to take away from it is the fact that they're going right into Kemet from the beginning. Plain and simple, because that's where their everything begins. Plain and simple. They had nothing before Kemet. Remember that. This is why the same people, the Greeks, that gave us the book, basically is telling us all they know. They don't know nothing before Kemet, because they didn't have nothing. They, didn't, they was illiterate. They couldn't read. They was fucking killing themselves because they couldn't prepare the food right. 
nothing. They had nothing. They were super primitive. All they know is coming from after they conquered Kemet, plain and simple. Everything that the Egyptians taught them, that's why they starting out with the Egyptians. All the stuff that's happening all over the rest of the world, we get a story that's supposedly dealing with our entire existence from this little teeny part of the world. And you would think God Almighty, you know, who created this entire earth, should be people everywhere. It's talked about people being scattered over the planet and everything like that. What's going on in these other countries, these other cities, these other towns that we got to focus so much on this one area? But it just so happened that the same geographical location just happened to be the same location dealing with the people of the book, the Romans, the Egyptians, the Arabs, the, the, the goddamn Greeks. It's, it's just common sense. And people just still in awe of the, of the book and not putting that together. The fact that, one, everything is dealing with this area. Plain and simple. When you read it, first of all, who could who could give you any of that information about Kemet anyway in the first place? The only people that can give it to you is us Africans, one, but we know it wasn't us, or the Greeks, the way they putting it. So again, it's them establishing themselves immediately in Genesis. And then when you end off in Genesis, which you have Joseph dying and basically you know, we're going into Exodus, which will, of course, give us the whole fictional story of Moses that they stole from Greek mythology. And, um, you know, there it is. Plain and simple. So, uh, you know, that that story uh, stole from Kemet, I should say, is more more towards the Kemet area. But those stories, all the stories, you know, through Galeon and Farah with Noah's Ark and all that stuff like that, we see a mix of them basically taking from Greek mythology and from Egyptian mythology to give us these stories to implement implement certain uh, you know ideologies, certain things that they want to impress on us later. But with Genesis, it's just the starting place, and you can see uh, exactly where they're trying to lead us. But the simple fact, and and that's what really kills it when I start really digging into Genesis, was all the interaction with the Egyptians that you find absolutely no proof of. That was what I looked for the most when I first went to Kemet was, okay, where? I mean, it got to be somewhere where we can prove this interaction with these uh, Hebrews. So imagine my surprise when I put it all together and I seen that, well, wait a minute, the Greeks created Hebrews. And then you got uh, Dr. Joseph Yehuda giving us the book, Hebrew is Greek. It's boom, it all comes together right there. So you can see clearly this interaction that they're talking about with these so-called Hebrews, they created the Hebrews, they are the Hebrews. It's the Greek interaction that they have with the Egyptians. Plain and simple, easy. Everything else from the beginning of Genesis, giving us the creation story, giving us the creation of ourself, establishing uh, it's so much uh, metaphysics still in there with um, Genesis 32:30, Jacob and the whole pineal. Remember, even with that whole thing was weird because you have with the uh, with the Jacob story, it's kind of crazy that I missed that one. You have Jacob, you know, he's sitting there, he's worried about his brother coming with 400 men coming to kill him and everybody. He's worried about that. But then all of a sudden you got this whole them preparing for that and them, you know, dividing the men up and everything, all this stuff going on. The Bible good for this, as you'll see. And I pointed this out already. All this stuff going on that all of a sudden you had this one side story where basically uh, Jacob is wrestling with God or with the angel. And then, you know, the angel say, hey, what is your name? Well, my name is Jacob. Your name is not Jacob no more. Your name is Israel. What is that about? And then for, the, you know. After that, okay, my name is Israel now. After that, they, they still call him Jacob. So it was like, what was the point? So you remember when you had these name changes, when uh, Abraham was changed to Abraham, that name stuck. They didn't call him Abraham no more. They called him Abraham. You had also when, uh, when was it Sarah was changed to Sarah. Same thing. It wasn't changed again. It was called her Sarah. So with Jacob, when his name was changed to Israel, still was calling him Jacob. And then it's not until you get later on when uh, Joseph comes, when the Bible starts periodically calling him Israel. That's one of the things people get confused. Uh, Genesis chapter 48. Let's just go down here to two. Uh, and it says, and one told Jacob and said, behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and set upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty, 
appear unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and bless me. Even here in verse 8, it's saying, And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father. So we know Israel is talking about Jacob. They are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were them for age. Then if you switch over here to chapter 49, it's saying, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Now it's weird, right? Because Abraham and Sarah, once their names was changed, they never again called them the former names. But with Jacob, it goes back and forth. When I look, when I researched that, I was looking at it's so many Bible scholars that talk about this. None of them can give you a definitive explanation of what that whole thing is about. Plain and simple. And to me, I think it's them really wanting to establish that name Israel as much as possible, as much as possible to try to get it out there early, to try to have it some kind of context with um, Egypt somehow, some way. So that then, you know, when, when we got the whole uh, Marabatai Stella right here. When we got this whole Stella and it supposedly had uh, Israel in there so they could try to establish the fact that the Egyptians knew about the people of Israel or knew the name Israel and somehow put it in that Stella, which has already been proven to been tampered with and them to basically make that look like Israel when it's not, you know, it's fake as bullshit. But it's, an, it's just one of those weird things. And uh, Genesis is just, you know, the stories is replete with so much stuff and um don't want to get into all of it because it's not the most important part and a lot of this stuff is going to make more sense as we go on and we'll go back and you know jump into genesis as i said to kind of sort of um uh, make a lot of this stuff fit and work it's going to be the same way as we go on we'll go back and backtrack to some of the verses to make the point but it's easy to see you know so the the beginning of the bible the genesis part is the best book to basically debunk the entire thing as far as being, you know, not real. So just Genesis alone going through it, you can break it down more and see what they was really talking about and where this stuff really fits and and how they set in the stage for everything else. Plain and simple. Uh, like I said, it's pointing you to Kemet. Talked about in that game, the Bible Christianity finally explained. It's all pointing you back to Kemet and it's early in the Bible where they put pointing you to Kemet. And just anybody who knows that history knows that we can't go there and find anything that really traces this whole Abrahamic faith, you know, in any kind of way with the Egyptians. So all of it is really put there to really just establish this faulty history for the Hebrews and to really try to make them fit somehow with Kemet. Because remember, it's always it's all about them establishing that history to try to make the Exodus story fit to give them some kind of relationship before Exodus to make it fit, to uh, give validity to the Jews. So as I said with the book of Enoch, you know, if, if, if the book of Enoch is giving you something that's supposed to be true, then again, it's one of the ways you can look at it and say, you know, because we don't know if they're trying to just establish themselves as, you know, you know, the whole race after Noah being all white, then you have to ask yourself, well, where did black people go? If everybody on the earth was wiped out and killed, and we know Noah, as it's talking about in the book of Enoch, was supposed to have been white, different, a different nature of his parents who clearly had to be black. Then what's going on? How was his nature different? What, what is they talking about? You know, and then, you know, once he had kids, did he give birth to black kids and white kids? What's going on? So it's a lot that is tied up in that that we're going to get into because that's a that's a deep one right there as far as the book of Enoch, which, of course, they left out of the King James Version because it just don't fit. So we still got to touch on that and get into that, which we will. So it's, it's crazy, but it's a lot. It's a lot to it. You can't really just, you know, you got to read. You got to read the Bible. You still can read through it. But again, as I said, remember, this is just the key point. When you read through it, don't read it as if it's a story. You know, the next verse is supposed to be next and it's supposed to go in some kind of order. Don't think of it like that. Just read it. Take notes. Just read through it because a lot of stuff that makes sense for Genesis is found like three, four books later, as we'll, you'll see. So with the Bible original name being Helios Bibliotech, 
which is Greek for basically Book of the Sun, what Gene, Isis, Genesis, you know, the names. It's another thing that just gives it all away. The names themselves, where they come from. Greeks, Egyptian, Greek, Ethiopian, Greek. All these names and terms that's put into the King James Version that, that we find in the biblical sense as far as how they worded this stuff. It's Greek. Plain and simple. And they actually kept the Greek words, which is crazy to me. So it it's telling you right there. So, you know, it's, it's big. It's, it's, it's deep for a lot of people to understand. And as uh, we go on, you're going to see how it latches on with Freemasonry and everything else. Trust me, it's, it's, it's deep. And um, it's a lot to it. But, you know, you know, I highly recommend people going through and reading the book. I mean, after the series, you don't really have to. I mean, a lot of the stuff is really just stories. It's bullshit. It's kind of sort of a waste of time. In some instances, but it's still good to do and take notes on so you can just know for yourself. But we're going to go through it and we're going to just, we're going to, you know how I do it. It's going to make sense. It's going to be crazy. So, you know, wanted to get Genesis out the way. First book of the Bible. Not too much to really harp on, but we still want to go back. We're going to get into Exodus next and really start breaking this whole thing down as far as, you know, the whole story with the Jews because it's deep and it's crazy. It's a lot to get into that we, we just got to understand to put out there. Got to get put out there. So, um, yeah, I want to thank you guys for taking the time to watch and support purchase. And uh, we got a long way to go with this series. It's going to be DVDs that I put out in between. That's going to help, you know, this make more sense in certain ways, but not, not really. I'm going to try to keep everything in this, just this biblical series. As a matter of fact, I will. That way nobody get confused. But it's a lot. You know, it's a lot. And um, I don't want to give too much away in newer videos for what we're going to be seeing in this series. So, Definitely keep up with it. It's going to be good. It's going to take us a while to get through it, but it's going to be worth it. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for taking the time to watch and purchase and support and see you next video.